Well, good morning, dear Thai, dear Sangha, dear friends, dear Mother Earth, dear everyone, everything. Mm. So today is January 1st in the year 2020. And we're in the ocean of peace meditation hall during our holiday retreat with the theme of healing ourselves and healing the world. And so this morning the, the tweens agreed to come and stay for a while. Thank you. In your song, there was a couple of things that you sing about that I want to share about. The first is power. You say our superpower is love. So we all... Uh, want to feel powerful in our lives, right? But there's different kinds of power and how we use our power. There's a story of uh, two uh, kings in the medieval times that were uh, trying to demonstrate for each other who was the most powerful one. And one, he say, all my subjects, if I tell them to climb up to the highest tower in the castle and jump to their death, they would do it. He felt like that was showing that he had power, the people would do everything that he say. They probably would do that because otherwise they might up and worse in prison or torture or killed anyway if they would dare to disrespect and disobey the king, right? Do you think that's kind of a power? Yeah? Not really, huh? Yeah. If we make people scared and we threaten people, and that's how we feel like we feel strong. It's not really strong, right? But the second king, he was a little bit more uh, awake. He was sharing, my power is so strong that wherever I go in my whole country, with my men and my entourage, anyone will take us in and offer us a meal and somewhere to sleep. Ah, that starts sounding like something of building community, of valuing and cherishing everyone. A society and a place where power actually help us all to feel safe, help us all to have a, a place in society. So we can, might feel like we're still young, maybe we don't have so much power, but actually we have a lot of power in how we engage in our daily lives. We can learn to be masters of our actions, of our way of thinking, of our way of speaking, and our way of acting. And so in school you might uh, have friends, and when your friend is next to you, it's easier to uh, feel strong and resist to be teased or resist to do something that you don't want to do, right? So we can see the power of two. If you have you and a good friend, you feel powerful, you feel more maybe secure. You can do things that you want to do and resist doing the things you don't want to do more easily. So it's something that happens in our daily life. What makes us feel strong? What makes us feel secure and okay? That our, our idea matters, our view, our lives, our happiness matters and to learn how to act in a way that we can keep that alive. But there can also be a tremendous power with just one person. If one person sees something in the classroom, maybe uh, someone is being teased and we stand up for that person. I'm sure there's other people in the classroom too, they have the same thing but they don't want to say anything. They're scared to be the next one being teased. So if we just as one person can say, hey, that's not cool, you know, and stand up for that person, that is kind of a, the superpower is love. It's not sitting in our room and thinking how wonderful it would be if everyone loved each other. There's no power in strengthening that yet. But we're able to bring it to our lives, to our school, to our playgrounds, to our activities, to our homes, then it can become a power. And so I saw on your, uh, your door, you have a peace sign, right? You have a peace sign on your door, the twin door? Yeah? You have a beautiful sign there, I like it. So it inspired me to use the peace sign to, 
to continue to share about two other elements you were talking about. And so you're sharing about uh, love, right? Some things like love, we say so much, oh, I love you, mom. I love this, I love that. So we think we know what it is, right? Do you think you know what love is? Yeah? Yeah? So let's, uh, let's check. <laughs> so we talk about love and true love having four aspects four different ways it can express oneself. The one I wanted to share is called sympathetic joy. Okay. This has the power to heal our world. There's so much comparing, there's so much competing, there's so much... Uh, you this, I'm this, and then we see like happy or sad depending on if we get what we want. But this helps us to be happy and joyful if something beautiful happened to us or if something great happens to people around us. So for example, let's say a friend gets an A on the test and we get a B. What is our reaction? I feel like, oh, you know. Maybe he, their mom could help them more than I could, so that's why they get an A now, and it's not fair, or whatever. We can, ah, oh, the teacher, they didn't, you know, the way they made the test, we can come up with all these excuses why this happened to us. But we forget to celebrate our friend that have an A, right? So that is the power to be alive. That's the power of love, that we can celebrate the successes of people around us. Someone get elected to be in the soccer team? Or someone get a new instrument and learning an instrument? How can we rejoice with them? And then letting their success maybe inspire us to try harder or to see what, what do I really want to care about? What do I really want to do? And to feel joyful when I ah, actually recognizing, you know, this topic is really difficult for me and like I'm getting a beat is quite, quite something. You know, so we can see things from different perspectives. So with the grown-ups, I'll continue to talk about love because true love is one of the five mindfulness trainings too that could be a, a way to transform our world. You might have heard about the two promises too that talk about love. You know what the other aspect of the two promises? Understanding, understanding. yeah, you got it. You sang about understanding too. Understanding. There's a great power in understanding things. Because if we can understand things, we can be happier. And it also make it easier for us to develop this power with people around us. So there's a story about a, a group of people that were blind from birth. And they all get to meet an elephant for the first time in their life and they all get to hold a different part of the elephant. One person get to hold the tail, one person get to hold the ear, one person get to hold the leg, and then they ask them to describe what, what it was that we're touching. And so the person holding the tail says, it's a broom, it's a broom, I'm sure, it's a broom. And the person holding the leg says, it's not a broom, it's a pillar. It's a great pillar. And the person holding the ear is saying, no, 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 you all got it wrong. It's a fan. It's a big fan. And there's a couple of more. But if we want to understand, we have, instead of start fighting, they start fighting over who's right. You know, that is kind of childish. You're probably over that already, right? Some of us never get over that. <laughs> so if we have the capacity to stop, that's what we're training with listening to the bell and coming back to our breathing, of feeling our feet on the earth. 
We want to learn to have a kind of an inner stopping so that when things happen in our lives, we're not just reacting. Boom, 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 boom. We have so many habits of reacting, even when we're young. We learn from our parents, we learn in school, we're told certain things and we take it for granted. And we, we don't stop. But if we stop and to look, really? You felt the broom? Oh, that's so odd. I, felt, I thought I was touching a, a fan. How about the others? And maybe together they can figure out, like, ah, it's something else. It's not just limited to a broom. It's not just limited to a fan. But actually, the bigger picture might be more beautiful, right? An elephant is so much more powerful and like endearing than, uh, than just uh, the ear seeming to be a fan, right? So many things in our lives, it's just like that. We say we want to walk on Mother Earth. Do you see yourself, do you know that you're a child of the Earth? The other day, Sister D was talking about how we all have fire in us, we all have earth, water and air in us. And somehow along the way we get this idea that we're human, so we're kind of like important or something. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of different from the earth, that we're like special somehow. And we believe that, that we're special. So we, we take this idea of humans and earth out of each other, it's like separate. And we take the idea of of spiritual things and material things and separate them. And so that's why we think that if we just get the things we want in the material world, we'll be happy. But actually, we've separated ourselves. So to be able to be happy, to feel powerful and strong, we need to reunify ourselves so both our mind and body can come together both energy and matter can come together and we start realizing we are the earth. And so if I'm the earth, if I'm a child of the earth, you're a child of the earth. And so then I kind of start realizing actually the love, I want to treat you the way I want to be treated. It becomes a lie because you are me. You know? We're both the earth. Right? So this is to, to stop and to ask questions so we can understand more deeply. And then, so when you look at each other, it seems like you're getting along really well already. But when you look at each other or your siblings, sometimes you want to fight with each other or something, to look again and seeing, like, ah, is your happiness my happiness? Are you also a child of the earth just like me? so that we realize that actually we're connected as well. Yeah? And from that place, we can uh, develop the superpower of love. So it's based in understanding and love. Yeah? You think you can do it? Yeah? So the song is not just for fun, huh? It's also a beautiful message how we can sing. It's for fun. And it's beautiful to offer to the, the Sangha but it's also for us to practice and to see what is in that song. There's many different things in that song. So if you take the sheet home and remember it and look at things, that can already be a great gift from this retreat. So thank you so much for coming. So with a small sound of the bell, we can ask our young people to stand up and bow. So if you stand up and face all the aunties and uncles, your parents behind you, Ba. Remember, it's the first day of the year, so do the thing you want to do in this new year, okay? Yeah.
So the, the theme of the talk today is uh, healing our world. When I first was asked, I think I heard healing the earth. I say, there's a lot of pressure. I feel kind of heavy now. <laughs> and uh, recently I asked uh, one of the organizers, so you have any idea what I should talk about? And she's sharing that, well, you're going to talk about the five mindfulness trainings, right? <laughs> As a, a way of healing our world. And I will uh, see if we can weave it in with some other elements and continue with what we're sharing with the young people about uh, kinds of power. And so uh, we consider love, understanding, and uh, third element here as powers or as virtues, as spiritual powers that we all can cultivate. Sometimes the, the path of practice or the Dharma is referred to as the path of understanding and love. So it's kind of a central. And the last one is uh, cutting through afflictions. We can talk about it as letting go, even such a thing as letting go of our distraction when we're committed to sit and follow our breathing. It's kind of cultivating the strength of letting go. We can talk about it as throwing away. Habits that we might have in our lives that we're like determined, like, no, I will not continue. We won't throw them away. Or we can talk about it as cutting through afflictions, cutting through the things that's creating suffering for us and people around us. So I wanted to continue to explore these uh, three powers together with um, the mindfulness trainings. And when I was reflecting on the, the spirit of the mindfulness trainings, uh, I could see three different elements. I was uh, seeing to insist, to resist, and to persist. So on the spiritual path, it's not like one, one moment and we touch something beautiful and we think, ah, I got it. And sometimes we do when we live with that memory for years and years, but actually we're not touching it. So to insist to bring our awareness to our steps, to insist to come back to our breath, to train ourselves to be present. To train ourselves to look deeply into things. So the trainings all start with aware of the suffering caused by. So this is also to insist, to keep looking. Right? Sometimes we think, ah, oh, we know that already. I think that's why the organizers decided to call the talk Healing Our World instead of the Five Mindfulness Trainings. I think more of you showed up today because of it. Because <laughs> the five trainings, I know it already. I've been coming for retreats for 10 years. I received them this, and my name is that. And that's great. And there might be areas where it becomes stagnant and not really alive. We don't see it as a path of transforming our lives and the world. We're creating the world with our actions. We're co-creating the world all the time. Insist, we can say like it's saying yes to something, right? And we have resist here. It seems like in the, the climate change movement, there's a lot of resisting. It's uh, great to look into. How do I resist? What do I resist? How do I resist business as usual? 
that we see is creating a lot of suffering for the ecosystem and for animals, plants, humans within this ecosystem. And so in September, a group of brothers, they went down for the school strike for the climate to San Diego, and they had a sitting at uh, the high school. And uh, I was asking myself, how do I strike? Because I didn't go. So I didn't go, which helped one brother to go, because we're cooking that day. So I thought, okay, that's, you know, we do together. But then I was reflecting on how do I resist business as usual just through living the way I live, the way we live. You know, so we can like unpack this. How do we say no in our daily life? Say no to contribute to creating more suffering. And to persist, we know, like we mentioned, that it's not just like a one-moment thing and everything will be fine forever, but it's a, a path, it's an unfolding, it's an ongoing manifestation of this body, these feelings, these thinking, but also everyone and everything around us. And it all needs nourishment to live. My aspiration to practice and to practice the five trainings, it needs nourishment. It needs to bring me something valuable. I need to remember that it actually is a protection for me. I talk about as creating a zone of freedom. Because we're resisting some things that will make us suffer. And so in persisting, it might be meeting with a local sangha, finding ways to practice on a daily basis on ourselves, Because the foundation of the mindfulness trainings is training in mindfulness, to be aware of what is going on. And so how are we nourishing that so it can last over a period of time? How are we developing the trunk of our tree, our human tree, so that when storms come, we don't crash and we don't crack because we come back to the trunk. The trunk of the tree can endure storms. All oh, the solid mountain in us can endure storms. It's not that easy to uh, discourage us. So these are daily practices we can do to go in the direction of actually making the world more beautiful. Our own world and the world around us. And so how can we persist? So we need to learn from each other on this topic too. How do we see that we keep growing on the spiritual path? How does our happiness, our freedom grow? How does our capacity to be with our suffering and the suffering of the world increase? Or are we just like staying in the same spot, just barely like, uh, you know, gasping air? And it might be our situation. And then ask ourselves if there's something I can say yes to, this is something I can try to resist or say no to. And then, how do I nourish myself and put my energy into things that will, will strengthen me over time? It might be to come together as a Sangha to recite the five trainings, and also have a chance to have discussions about them. What are we learning? And it's a, a living thing. The five trainings have developed a lot from the time of the Buddha. And so, Thay is really wanting us to adopt it so it makes sense for our time and the suffering of this time. So, depending on who you ask, there might be different suffering that will come up. What is the suffering? Aware of suffering. What suffering? So this is also, again, to look at this understanding. We're looking at a training, the first training of reverence for life. And it talks about the awareness of the suffering caused by the destruction of life. So if we use the story about the elephant, like 
what kind of destruction of life are we aware of? All that is inspiring us. And what are other friends in my Sangha aware of? And is it just killing a human being? Is it killing animals, plants? How about species? You know? And it seems like when is killing going on on a massive scale, human activity is, is exploiting habitat, so animals are going extinct. It's changing the biosphere, so some species cannot adjust quick enough, and species are going extinct. Are the, is it the suffering of uh, unarmed black men being shot down by police? What is it, the suffering caused by destruction of life that we're aware of? And how can we bring compassion to that? So we want to bring awareness in order for us to touch compassion, not for us to be overburdened and discouraged and despairing, but in a way that we can touch compassion. I remember Tai was answering a question once about euthanizing our pets. And the person asking, do you think it's an ethical thing to do to put our dog to sleep when he suffers so much? And so then again, like, how aware are you of your dog's aspiration to live? And Tai, I hope I'm not misremembering this, but Tai is saying like, so you could try it out by creating a situation where the dog would actually feel like his life was being threatened. Maybe bring out a big knife or something, go towards the dog and see what the dog would do. Oh, seriously, like a dog in pretty difficult situation would probably try to run away, right? Or crawl away. And so, This is just one area where we become accustomed to something, so it seems like, okay, that's the compassionate thing to do, but we, maybe we stop looking into it, really? Is it because it's really out of compassion of the dog, that is our good friend? Or is it too painful for us to see it suffer? Or is it too unpractical to have a dog with these symptoms or needing this treatment or care? So what is it? is the awareness of, and to go deeper into that. And so we can kind of uh, pinpoint any situation in our lives where we see there's some kind of destruction of life, or there's some kind of killing going on, and go in, and there's a whole world opening up. So in that sense there, when we talk about the precepts and mindfulness training, they're like the ocean. One lifetime alone is not enough to study and practice them, because there's so much in there. And I think that's also why Thai keeps revising them, so it doesn't become like this certificate, I've done that, I'm okay with this. But actually that it inspires us to keep looking, to keep looking into life, to keep looking into the suffering in the world, and the suffering in ourselves. So the five trainings, they also embody the path of understanding and love. And two kind of a core values or elements that I appreciate is uh, 
the element of uh, non-harming and the element of non-duality. It's kind of like a a backbone of our kind of engaging in the training. I recently listened to uh, a couple of Dharma talks that uh, Larry Ward gave. He's a PhD in Buddhist studies and also a Dharma teacher in our tradition. He was giving talks. Uh, this was a workshop in Taos that was online. It's called America's Racial Karma. And he was sharing about how the separation from the earth, seeing ourselves as separate and different from the earth, it also gives rise to this sense of separation and ground for discrimination among each other. Whether it's uh, people of different colors, different ethnic backgrounds, social situation, that we think we're separate and somehow when we think we're separate, it's also okay to treat others worse than I would treat myself or my children, right? So this is kind of at the core of it, this, this duality that has created, this belief that we're kind of separate, we're individuals competing for survival. And in there too, scientists have seen that when you, depending on how you look at something, you can find it. <laughs> So if we look more with collaboration, we're learning how trees collaborate, collaborate on the ground, for example. Sending energy and nutrients to younger trees, but also sometimes to trees of different species, that they collaborate, right? So this can be a, a very empowering if we're able to come in contact with the interbeing nature of us and the earth of our body and our mind, and then start letting that spread out to our families, to our society, people around, and what is the next awareness we can bring about? Where am I still blind? What part of the elephant am I not touching? Do I know someone that may be touching that part of the elephant? You know, can I hear their story? so that I can wake up to understand. And so for maybe any moments or time we spend in looking into suffering, awareness of suffering, maybe we take at least equal amounts of time to look into what is our happiness. What are the wonders that are manifesting, even with all the difficulties and challenges, what are the wonders that are manifesting? How wondrous is it to be able to open my heart and to look at someone with genuine care for them? How wonderful is it to be able to drink a cup of hot water? Knowing that this cup of water has been circling the planet for a long, long time. It has been brought into my hands by the endearing elephant family washing the cups and filling the hot water, right? And we're all doing something to help these miracles manifest for each other, right? So this is an aspect of service meditation too, to offer something and also to be aware of how many people bring about what comes to us, the miracles that we're able to engage in. So if we look at uh, non-harming and reverence for life, is, uh, there's so many different uh, different uh, levels we can practice that on. And also the humility that we do cause harm to 
to recognize, I do in my daily life, I do cause harm for someone or maybe something we would call something, but it's actually a living organism as well. Mm. And so then to maybe uh, naturally value the things we are receiving more and maybe seeing that actually like I have enough. Christ offered us so many great teachings and through his calligraphies, like, you have enough. Which brings us into the, the second mindfulness trainings on true happiness. And so, like the other trainings, it helped us to look into the suffering caused by exploitation, stealing, injustice, and oppression. But then also from that place, to insist, to say, like, I do not want to take what doesn't belong to me. In the old wording, it would be, what has not been given. I don't want to have anything that hasn't been given freely. Not take what should belong to others. So to receive these gifts that we are kind of participating in. And it's also stepping out of a consumeristic view of like, I work, I get a paycheck, so I have money, I'll buy, and then it's just like, it's devoiding matter with spirit and life and forgetting the history of this product that showed up, right? We just feel entitled. We work hard for it, so we deserve it. And so to recognize that, that's okay. We all deserve to be happy and safe and have enough food and clothing and safety and medical care, but so many don't. So it's the complexity or the contradiction of being able to receive the gifts, the wonders that we have, we're offered, that we can somehow participate and receive. At the same time, be aware that everyone's not in that situation. And so maybe... uh, it would be good for me to know how many have already received the trainings. Can we take a poll? <laughs> okay, great. And how many have never heard about the five trainings of what I've been talking about so far? Seem kind of like just that, no association. Okay, great. There will be printed copies of them later on too. <clears throat> but this element of being aware of suffering is a, a key element in them and to have different elements that we, we insist, we say yes. And on true happiness, it, it invites us into a practice saying, I already have more than enough conditions to be happy. Wow. I don't know how about you, but I still think I need a little bit more condition. I need to transform this, or if this just work out in the Sangha, or if this would happen, then, then I'll be happy enough, you know. If everyone just treat everyone nicely, and we share, then I could be happy. It's kind of seemed like far-fetched. Am I waiting for all that to be happy? Whew, I might suffer for a long time, so... <laughs> Until everyone is really, like, generous and caring and looking out for everyone else. You know, which is beautiful, so that is like the North Star, that is, I'm hoping for us to experience that. But I cannot make my happiness in the present moment depend on that North Star beautiful situation. So then look into also 
the things, the conditions I do have for my happiness. And we forget very quick, like a year ago, I joined two other walking meditations. One of them I walked down towards the, the Buddha garden. And when we come to the, the parking lot, I saw they were going up the fire road. It's like, I'm not going there. So I, I sat down on the, on the cart stop and Ali was joining. We sat there and breathed for a long time until the, we would start walking up again. Just because I couldn't. Couldn't walk up there. And so I, I want to remind myself not to just repeat the story of the past, but to remember that to being able to have enough breath energy to sit here and talk, wow, that's the conditions for happiness. To know that during a lazy time, I'm going to be able to go up the mountain and enjoy the wilderness up on the mountain. Wow, there's conditions for happiness. So they kind of, they come and go. And it's easy to take things for granted, like we always had them, we're always going to have them, and then we just realize when they're lost that actually I've been so fortunate. So I just want to read a, a, a sentence from the second mindfulness training so we maybe also help bring to light this insisting and resisting. It says, I am determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should belong to others. It's kind of this resistance. And it brings a kind of a commitment with it. Huh? I'm determined to. But then knowing too that actually it's not like either or, it's not like a fixed thing, it's a dynamic process of... So this land was part of the Kumaya nation, I don't know how long time ago, so should we abandon it and give it back? Because we're, in a way, we're, it hasn't been freely given, right? So it's a complicated issue, so it, again, maybe not to... Um, have an idea what is right and wrong, but a humility and a respect for people that have lived here before and try to make good use of this gift that we received. So we don't just keep it for yourself, but we invite all of you guys to come, right? In other ways. And so the sentence continues, I will share my time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. But that's also the saying yes to something, there's something concrete that we can do. So if we just recognize the suffering and then we don't know what to do, it's easy to get caught in despair. And so Thai reminds us that if we get trapped in despair, it's the worst thing that can happen to us. Because we cannot be happy, the people around us cannot be happy, and we cannot contribute to any transformation of any kind. You know? And so, reminding us too, we don't have to, we don't have to discourage and despair because we can act. So again, like I just shared with the tweens, if we're able to stop, we're able to nourish ourselves. 
and we're able to see things clearly, what is going on, what is the suffering, what is the cause of suffering, how can I contribute to lessening suffering, or helping myself and others embrace suffering, so we don't add the second and third and fourth arrow, like Sister Kinyin was sharing about. Yeah. That is a very concrete way how we can engage and insist we're not giving up. Doesn't mean we think we can change everything right away. You know, there's a... When I uh, shared with them about the power of... <clears throat> of one, I also think of uh, Greta, my fellow countryman from Sweden, country uh, climate uh, activist. And in a... Uh, a TED talk she gave the last couple of minutes, she, she was saying, she, she pays attention, huh? It's very sharp. And she's saying, you know, around this time in the talk, most people talk about hope because we have solar panels and we have this and that, the technology will save us. I say, no, no, no I'm, not, I'm not going there. But she offered the same message as Ty was offering. Like, when I started to act, when I start coming in front of the Swedish parliament on Fridays, I was never alone. So when I start acting, I see hope everywhere. Huh? So it's easy that when we're in a, a space we feel isolated or we feel powerless and we play a tape in our mind of what what the situation is, or what should be different, or whether it's my own person that I cannot accept, and find a way to transform and heal, or if it's society, whatever like level we're looking at, if we feel discouraged and despairing, can we stop and recognize? So actually, this, the trainings are powerful, kind of a roadmap into transformation, to be aware of suffering. And based on fundamental insights of non-duality, how can we act in a way that will lessen suffering? How can we contribute to beauty? And also, how can we keep going? Because we like it. Right? And we need these kind of um, yearly rituals of the new year, for example, to like reignite and kind of uh, begin anew and start over and seeing like learning from the past, but also like with new energy stepping into something new. It's easy that we just keep dragging the past behind us. You know. Our hopes, our dreams of the past that hasn't come through. So, okay, this year I'm going to have to make it happen. I'm talking from experience. <laughs> it becomes heavier after a while. You have to let it go. <laughs> but this is also part of the, the power of cutting through afflictions. We're attached to certain views of what we would like to be, what we would like to do, what we would like to see happen, and if not, we say, mm, keep pushing, we want to make it happen. And it takes a lot of energy. Sometimes in the, the monastic community, we say, like, when causes and conditions are sufficient, things will manifest. And it seems kind of like, could seem like detached, we don't care, we just see it's like just miraculously something would appear, but that's not actually what it is. We contribute to conditions for something to happen. And maybe for a while something is on the back burner because we see actually my physical health right now, I need to take care of it, I need to learn some new things. So kind of go in that direction. We know there's other things we care about, but we just cannot pick them all up at the same time. There's also the power of even not cutting off affliction, but even 
putting beautiful, valuable things to the side because it's just not enough conditions to take them on right now. That also takes discernment. And that was beautifully uh, um, mirrored. I've somehow I always uh, enjoyed like embodied uh, teachings and actions the most, even listening to Thai's talk more than the words. And uh, uh, Tang Wen Hai, the first abbot in Upper Hamlet in Plum Village, when I was a novice, he was uh, building these uh, big rocks. There's a lot of limestone in that part of uh, France. And so a lot of the buildings are in, in limestone and having these beautiful big rocks that they dug up somewhere. And they were putting them together as a big waterfall by the activity bell outside the dining hall. And then setting in the pump and so on. And there were like a couple of brothers working for a couple of days on that. And only afterwards he told us that I've been waiting f- to do that for 10 years. The condition haven't been sufficient until now. So that takes like a vision. We, we see a beautiful image and we want to make it manifest. But also take the wisdom to know like, okay, now is not the time. We don't have a place for people to sleep and we don't have like, there's so many things that is not, you know. So we need to focus on other things. And then the patience and the persistence to like, ah, when conditions are sufficient, we remember and we make it happen. I hear many of you uh, have enjoyed the, the path to the waterfall, right? How many have walked the path to the waterfall already? Yeah? It starts just at the, the dirt road. <clears throat> it's uh, the old path to the view deck that can, uh, keeps continuing. And so this past 90-day retreat, a good friend and brother for Blue, he was here for three months and he loved being in nature and he loved bushwhacking through the chaparral. So it's like, that's his kind of a, you know, getting away from a lot of work he did in Upper Hamlet. He had so much extra energy, so he just started making this path. And then a bridge appeared and then I want to connect it to the path on the other side, so... <laughs> And before he came, there wasn't enough conditions for that path to happen, right? And then there was a couple of uh, young, strong men here during the 90-day retreat. All of them are going to come back to be aspirants this coming year. Uh, they took turns to help him out. And the work coordinator also had enough people doing the other things. So there was enough conditions to do something you know, out of the ordinary, which then could benefit a lot of people, right? The waterfall is very happy too when we come and visit, whether the water is falling or not, or trickling or not. It's still a very nourishing, quiet place in the mountain to be very close to the earth and the rocks. It's been exposed to the elements for a long time. And so we have another couple of trainings. I'd like to share something about them. We had uh, touched on true love already a little bit. The third. And it both handles love in a wider sense of being able to bring people we love happiness, to be able to lessen their suffering. This is loving kindness and compassion. And to offer them joy, but also to rejoice in their joys. You know, that I just share joy. Not discriminate you and my joys, our joys, joy. And then equanimity, inclusiveness, that to start with that we include all parts of ourselves if we love ourselves. How can we accept even the, what some people call the shadow or the afflictions that's still in us? The narrow-mindedness, the unkindness, the violence that's still in us. How can we also accept and embrace that? This is kind of a, equanimous, this inclusive aspect of love. 
that when you can also then expand to other people. And so love is maybe not just for one person, but for many people, right? But it also talks about how to handle our sexual energy as human beings. We have sexual energy and sexual desire is a very natural part of us. But we can also see that it's creating a lot of suffering, you know, in so many ways. When we cannot handle our sexual energy, and many times it's misused as a way of getting some kind of false power, right? And so, actually this is one thing that inspires me to be a monk too, because even in my family or people I've seen and met in life, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's rape, whether it's sexual assault, so much that suffering that is caused by sexual energy or sexual desire that is not mastered. Mostly perpetrated by men. I say, ah, can I live a happy life as a celibate monk? Ah, that's a message to the young men in the world. You know? And so in that sense, I'm also practicing for the young man in me that was kind of told by society that, you know, if you don't have sex, you cannot be happy, basically. And your masculinity is kind of dependent on how many girlfriends you have or whatever. It's so sad, you know, and it creates so much like objectification of each other, living up to something and portraying ourselves as something that is risking to lose our contact with who we really are and what is the deeper nature of ourselves. And so, when we read through these trainings, there might be an area where we feel like, okay, I want to resist. I want to help the suffering to be lessened. There's one about, uh, I'm determined to do everything within my power to prevent children from sexual abuse. And so when I recite them and I read that, oh, so what have I done? Wow, not much. You know? And so, that's why the, the power of the Sangha can be so much stronger that when we come together and we share about the trainings and share with each other what are the things that I'm inspired to insist, to keep doing, what are the things I want to resist, to be a change agent for, then we can also kind of see that ah, actually together we can do something. So that's also a way of getting out of despair or discouragement for the like, eyes oh, too much. One, one challenge is that we're aware of so many things. We're distracted by so many things. And so it can be difficult to be able to stop, to clear our minds and be able to look deeply into something. So it's the cause of the suffering again. So it's not that we're creating this battle with suffering or injustice, but it's actually understanding the causes of suffering and how we can contribute in our own lives and the lives of the world to lessen suffering, to learn to embrace suffering. Transform things that are perpetuating suffering. Fourth mindfulness training. Okay, give me a sign when you're full, okay? I don't want to... <laughs> Just uh, ingesting the Dharma with moderation too is helpful. Are you full yet? Can keep going a little bit? It's okay? Okay. Deep listening and loving speech.
And so to listen here, we can expand it to not just our ears, but all the sensory input we're getting, the touch, what is in our minds. We can listen, meaning to be in touch with all of that. It's not just the hearing itself. If we want to come in contact with the earth and the trees, for example, there might not be a lot of sounds. But we might feel some kind of vibration. So learning to listen, it also is a training to be still. If we have endless conversation going on in our head, it's difficult to listen because we're already preoccupied listening to our internal dialogue. So this is where the mindfulness training cannot be separated out from just mindfulness practice, which basis is to stop, to calm, to relax, to refresh, to concentrate, and then to look deeply, to hear deeply, to see deeply, to understand how things are. That is beyond our idea of the world, of the earth. For example, how do we listen to the earth? So we're spinning right now, right? I was trying to figure out and get some like exact numbers on how fast we're spinning. It's not that simple, I realized. So we're spinning around our own axle, and it's quickest at the equator and slower at the poles. But then also we're spinning around the sun faster, and then the sun is spinning in our galaxy. It takes 250 million years for it to come back to the same place in the galaxy again even though it's not exactly the same place because it's, it's not like a symmetrical, repetitive motion that is actually changing. So learning about anything, we can you know, understand everything. And um, we might see Earth as the thing we see on the, the top soil layer with the plants with the clouds, even maybe the atmosphere, with the birds flying, but then going into the earth, then how much do we know? It's a couple of miles of solid rock, the crust that makes this planet livable. And apparently there's a lot of bacteria as you go down, there's a lot of bacteria, many of them not present, a living organism that is not present on the surface of the earth. And you go deeper and deeper in the outer core and the inner core, supposedly hotter than the surface of the sun. Liquid, magma. So the, the warmth and the density of the Earth is helping create the gravitational pull. And so in that sense, studying and learning things can help us to listen more deeply or be tight be like, my God, right? I think I learned these things like sixth, seventh grade. I think I knew everything. But <laughs> then I specialize in some things here and there, and it seemed like I lose the bigger picture completely. And so to listen deeply when we sit in meditation, for example, and we come back to our breathing, we can apply this deep listening to also the distraction that comes up in us. The memories that might come up, the thoughts, the planning, whatever it might be, we can also do, ah, it could be deep listening and recognizing these distractions or these things that is manifesting in, in us. And as a way to then insist, ah, but I want to come back to my breathing and see if I can follow the full length of my in-breath and out-breath. But 
but we're not making, uh, uh, fighting the planning for the future, saying, you're bad, you should go away. We're just recognizing it's there, we're here, and maybe we need to look into something, but maybe this is not the right time. And when we do it, we want to like focus our energy, that, okay, now I'm going to plan this out and see how I want to do this trip or whatever, like this presentation. And so if we just have that kind of sense of respecting, ah, maybe come up, our consciousness is telling us something, we need to look at something. Or if there's something, emotion that come up regularly when we sit and still ourselves, we cannot only practice just to let them pass as white clouds every time. We need to see also, oh, okay, what are the things that keep coming up? And when we're calm, we're a little bit more stable, how can I listen deeply to these things? whether it's an insecurity inside, whether it's a heat, an irritation inside, a frustration, whatever it is, to be able also to listen deeply within. And the way we relate to it, how can we relate to it with loving speech? So it's not just, you have to go away, I'm meditating now. But it's like recognizing, it. Ah, okay, I know you're there, but you're not the focus of my attention right now. So it's also training us to stay with what we choose. That is so helpful in daily life too, because there are all these stimulus. And then also seeing that our emotional life sometimes can make us speak in ways that we regret. Right? And so if we can cultivate awareness of the feelings inside, the way of perceiving, our life situation, perceiving others, we can keep cultivating this kind of a sense of space and this stopping element in relating to things, in relating to people, relating to certain situations. In the past, if I would bounce my head, that happens sometimes, you see, I, have, I was walking in the valley the other day and I was enjoying my steps. My hoodie was covering the next branch, I was like, boom! And so in the past, I would get like angry and kind of like blame the branch, and then I would say like, you know, trying to cover up how like stupid I felt like hitting my head on the branch. And then I would like try to go on as nothing happened. But now it's oh, okay. Like, I just, it hurts, I put my hand on my head, I just, Stay right here, see how it feels, like, I just... And there was thought, ah, oh, maybe we should cut this branch down, or... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For now, I'm just holding my head, you know. Make sure this uh, doesn't feel too jarred, and too shaky in there. <clears throat> and I could continue my walk. So I feel, ah, oh, it's still so light, you know. And I could also see that I inherited this way of relating from my dad. He's taller than me, so he bounces into even more things. So if he would, uh, you know, bounce his head into something or kick something, somehow that would be his vent to let out all the frustration and anger that he didn't express in other situations. So it's like. <laughs> It seemed like such a big thing all of a sudden, but it's like, you just bounce your toe, Dad. It's like, it's okay, is it broken? So we all have these, like, you know, habits or like vents where we're like, oh. where we're over, we exaggerate. It doesn't like, our response or reaction doesn't fit the situation. So that is a great opportunity of learning and of then committing. So like the next time I, whatever your thing is, I'm going to see if I can catch myself before I act in a habitual way. Whether it's speaking in frustration or anger, whether it's uh, speaking badly about someone, if it's spreading rumors because we're bored, so we start gossiping about this and that, you know? All kinds of things in our speech that uh, create troubles.
Uh oh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the fifth training is uh, nourishment and healing. And that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we try to organize the practice center in a way that the nourishment in the context we get is wholesome. So we ingest wholesome things. So together also you're contributing with so much uh, love and care. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you on the retreat to start this year. Thank you.